Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Lawcast. This time, we're going back to cover the promo that changed it all. It's the road to money in the bank. Kyush, where were you when CM Punk delivered the infamous pipe bomb promo? Seemingly unlike a lot of people in the world, I was actually watching the show by myself in a dark room because my wife had gone to bed because she was so disinterested in the show, like everyone should have been. Like me. Yeah, the number of people that I've heard from who turned that show off before the hype off, and I can't blame any of you, because it was one of the worst Raws of all time, and I just had to watch it again to do research for this show, and it was just as bad the second time. Yeah, I, you know, it's just one of those things. It was a bad show. I was not interested in the product at the time. Once we got, like, I was intrigued by the Punk Shawn Michaels segment at the start of the show, but once that didn't go anywhere, I was done, and I turned it off. And I woke, woke up the next morning to people talking about CM Punk doing this amazing promo, and I'm like, I didn't think that promo with Michaels was anything special. <laughs> huh? Let the record show that this is the second time that Steve has done this. The first being when Shawn Michaels turns on Hulk Hogan before SummerSlam. <laughs> and he turned off that tag match before Shawn Michaels super kicks Hulk Hogan. I should turn the shows off more often. Maybe something good would happen if I did. Really, you should just not watch the shows until the last five minutes. That's the better cure. Yeah. So, backing up. We just did Capital Punishment, which was a miserable, terrible, awful show. Coming CM out of it, Punk, there are no, stores, no stars at all. CM Punk retained the WWE title, beating R-Truth, which is really the end of R-Truth's push really turns out to be a one and done. They need a new number one contender. So the next night on Raw, it's Monday, June the 20th, 2011. We're at the first Mariner Center in Baltimore, Maryland. CM Punk opens the show with a promo where he demands a shot at John Cena for the WWE Championship. He says he deserves it after beating Cena on Raw the week before and Rey Mysterio at Capital Punishment the previous night. He says he didn't want the shot tonight in Baltimore. He wanted it at Money in the Bank in his hometown of Chicago. And, like, the crowd's actually kind of with him. Despite the fact that he's been nothing but, like, an absolute clear heel all the way up until this point, the crowd, I mean, he has a point. He clearly should probably be the number one contender, but he complains for so long that the anonymous general manager, through Michael Cole, tells him, fuck you, punk. Yes, as a reminder, they're still doing the the anonymous raw general manager at this point. Yes. So Punk, like, crosses his legs in the ring, sits down, and says, I'm not leaving until I get my title shot, at which point the anonymous general manager says he's got to win, like, some triple threat match in order to get it. And they tell him he has to beat Alberto Del Rio and Rey Mysterio in a triple threat match to become the number one contender. Um, The gimmick of this show, which was, for some reason, three hours long, they had not gone to the three-hour Raws yet, but... This was a special three-hour-long Raw. The gimmick here was the fans got to vote on the stipulations for the matches, like the old Taboo Tuesday. I just want to point out, we mentioned all throughout the course of the show last week that it was one of the most miserable creative periods ever. So imagine in the middle of that, now they have to come up with three hours of content. They don't succeed. (laughs) So here the fans got to choose between a no disqualification match, a submission match, and a Falls Count Anywhere match. And Falls Count Anywhere won. Or did it? Because there was a glitch with the voting where, I think this was, I don't know if this was the first time they did the text thing, but so many people were texting in votes, it was overloading the system, so the votes would come in on a delayed basis. And the way this voting worked was you didn't write out, like, no disqualification match. You just put, like, one choice was choice A, one was choice B, one was choice C. And so the votes would just come in A, B, and C. But they would come in, like, 20 minutes late in some cases because they were, I don't know, getting hung up on the satellite or however a text message works. I'm not an expert in this field. So in some cases, like, the votes got screwed up. Like, votes came in late, and, pe- like, votes for previous things were counted on the new match, and in some cases, the wrong thing won. So it's hard to say whether or not people actually wanted the Falls Count Anywhere match. 
The thing is, triple threat match or, matches are no disqualifications anyway, so there's no yes. reason to vote for that. A submission match sounds kind of cool, actually. Especially for the guys involved. I mean, Rey Mysterio didn't have a submission, but the other two guys do. Yeah. And, I don't know, false count anywhere is fine, and that's what won. Here's the two things about that fan voting also. Number one is you have to remember that for some odd reason, Vince McMahon took the, like, actual realness of the polls dead fucking seriously. Yeah. Everything it, in the world is kayfabe except that. Yeah, it has to be a shoot. If the fans are voting, it has to be the real deal. It's just the odd things Vince chooses to care about. So it's like must have driven him absolutely crazy when he found out at the end of the night, like, oh, all the voting was wrong. And speaking of that, all throughout the show, they do that thing where they show all like when if it's like, oh, who's going to face this person in the match tonight? Oh, it's one of these three people. And they're all like standing back there waiting to see who it is. All of them throughout the entire night are visibly shocked when they are chosen. Yes, because a couple of the choices make no sense. In one case, they actually, like, once they realized the vote was wrong, they, like, did the match the fans actually voted for the next week. Yes, which is a smart way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should. But, again, it's just funny what Vince thinks is important. Like, would anyone at no one would know if these votes were kayfabed and no one would care. No except one gives that, a shit. Yeah. Like he he probably genuinely took it personally that like, no god damn it, they wanted false count anywhere. <sighs> They'll never forgive me for this. Meanwhile he's putting on like the most asinine garbage product in the history of WWE. So Punk won the match. He pinned Del Rio after Mysterio hit Del Rio with the 619, but he threw Mysterio out of the ring and got the pin. So he becomes the number one contender for the title, and then he gets on the mic and he announces that uh, the night of Money in the Bank is the night that his WWE contract is expires, and he promised that he would leave the company with the title. So that is a pretty good hook. Uh, that definitely caught my attention at the time. Oh, yeah, it's super interesting. There had also been rumors vaguely throughout the entire year that, like, Punk was unhappy, that Punk wanted out. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah, like, I think in The Observer it had been reported a couple of times that they had offered him yeah. to renew. <laughs> Who can imagine? Yeah. I mean, WWE usually tries to get people to renew their contracts, like, a year before. They don't usually let that shit run down to the wire. So, like... The rumor was that he had been offered a couple contracts and had turned them down each time. It genuinely did kind of seem like he was leaving and probably never coming back. Here's something insane. What I just described to you was not the main event of the show. Nope. They put some random six-man tag match with Cena on last. It was like Cena and Orton and somebody against R-Truth and a couple somebodies. Of course they did. Because John Cena is all that matters, and that's the story that we're telling here. Like, how on earth can you not go off the air with the hook that Punk just said he's going to leave the company with the title? They don't even talk about it during the main event. They're not. It's not like one of those things like in WCW where the NWO would do something and then Tony Schiavone would be paranoid talking about it for the rest of the show. No. They don't mention it a single time after Punk goes off. Right on. But I mean, I have to say, like, it gets, like, I feel like this part gets lost because of what comes next. Like, this is a brilliant storyline. Oh, this God. is so intri- On its own, this is super intriguing. I mean, we've never really seen a wrestling company run with a storyline like this. Like, AEW just kind of tried it with MJF, and then they kind of, like, when he re-signed, obviously they backed off of it. But, like, it takes balls to actually do a storyline like this if you think the guy actually is going to leave. I mean, when they did this in Ring of Honor, like, the fans knew he was going to leave, but it wasn't initial. Like, going into that match he was having, was it part of the storyline? Well, what What actually happened was, like, so we knew he had actually signed before he won the title. So, like, the yeah. news that he would sign with OBW to be in the developmental happened, and then he won the belt. So then the fans started to convince themselves that that news wasn't true, that he was actually staying. And then he, like, signed, like, literally brought out the contract on the next show and signed it on the belt and said, ha-ha, fuckers, I'm taking the belt with me. 
And then every match, it was like, oh, this is it. He's going to drop the title now, and he and he didn't. And then he finally dropped it to Jamie Noble. <laughs> Jamie A Noble. footnote in history. So, um, honestly, there was not that much buzz. I feel like there was not a huge amount of buzz about this Punk storyline. Like, it got only a passing mention in the Wrestling Observer. It was just like, oh, yeah, and Punk said he's going to leave with the belt, and uh, his contract is expiring soon. Well, there's two reasons for that. One, of course he would say that, but, like, would you ever believe in your right fucking mind that that could ever be the actual conclusion to this story? No, right? No one at this point is buying that CM Punk is going to beat John Cena for the title. Like, it's just not a thing that's going to happen. Not only is he not going to beat him at all, because John Cena's been beating his ass for, like, nine months straight, but, like, there's no way he's going to take the title and leave. He's probably not even going to leave, because at this point, nobody left. It had been years since anybody had actually chosen to leave WWE. It, it was since Christian went to TNA, since Kurt Angle went to TNA. Basically, yeah. Five years. Yeah. It was like flat out. Anybody real who jumped other than that. Until next, the following week. It was just completely impossible to imagine this as anything other than just a regular WWE storyline. It was a cool hook, but that's all it was. So the next week... They do Raw in Las Vegas at the Thomas and Mack Center. It's uh, June 27th, 2011. This episode is Raw Roulette in Las Vegas. Again, it seems like we're getting a gimmick show every single week at this point. They're just desperate to get people to keep watching the fucking show at this point. <laughs> just they have no compelling stories. All they can do is gimmicks. I mean, you got to remember that most of the storylines that you remember from this time period that aren't this – are on SmackDown. The Christian and Randy Orton thing, the Mark Henry Hall of Pain thing, all that stuff is all on SmackDown. This show has nothing. Not a single storyline. Yeah. John Cena's not doing shit. There's no storylines. It's just this. Um, So Shawn Michaels opened the show plugging his new hunting show, which was about to debut on the Outdoor Network. I don't feel like that lasted too long. I would have no idea. <laughs> Punk interrupted him along with his Nexus stablemates, David Otunga and Michael McGillicuddy, who were the tag champions at this point. As much as everyone involved would love to erase the fact that on the night of the pipe bomb, the new <laughs> Nexus was with him, that shit happened. A little note when he does the pipe bomb promo, he's not wearing his new Nexus shirt. Very specifically, he's not. Punk reiterated that he was leaving after Money in the Bank, that he would beat Cena for the title. He said he was leaving because the fans didn't support him enough. He complained that they cheered for Sean more than for him. Sean came back saying that was because he's better than Punk. Punk acknowledge punk actually kind of weirdly was like yeah you were better than me but i'm better than you now sure the crowd got really fired up by the idea that we were going to get sean versus punk here that is such a tantalizing what might have been yeah they could have made magic and this is what i go back to is god i wish sean even like it's fine that he didn't want to work full-time anymore i wish he had kept doing wrestlemania because He had a lot of great WrestleMania matches left in him that he left on the table, but of course he, he just felt like if he didn't close the book on it and fully retire, he would keep, because I think he had wanted to retire for years before he did. And Vince just wanted the Cena match to be his last match. Yeah. All the way back in Detroit and seven or whatever. Yeah. So he keeps going for years after that. Vince just keeps begging him. Same thing that happened with Undertaker. Vince was just begging, hey, I need I need you for this big show. We need you. We're not going to draw without you. Think think of the guys and the paychecks they need to get. Like, he just kept getting sucked back in. But, yeah, him against Punk would have been amazing. And, and what can... a great story. I mean, just the clash between straight-edge CM Punk and, like, him being like Shawn Michaels is a drug addict, he's a false prophet, he's a hypocrite, a liar. It would have been awesome. There's two men I looked up to when I was a boy, my dad and Shawn Michaels, and they were both drug addicts who left me down. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> cool. Um, 
Sean nailed Otunga with Sweet Chin music. That ruled. That ruled. <laughs> then the anonymous Raw GM buzzed in to announce that Punk would have to wrestle. They spun the wheel. It landed on Mystery Opponent, who was revealed to be Kane. And then Michaels hit McGillicuddy with Sweet Chin music and left. And I want you guys to understand that, like, the new Nexus doesn't die when CM Punk abandons them during all of this. But as far as their role in the CM Punk storyline, Shawn Michaels basically super kicks them out of it. They are never going to, like, Punk is never going to be seen with these jabronis again. No. I mean, they're literally going to have, like, the new Punk shirt made the next, like, two weeks later. Um, Punk and Kane had an uneventful match where he got himself intentionally counted out. And at this point, I turned off the show. Can't blame you, man. When Kane comes off, comes on, the TV comes off. Yep. Yes, it does. The main event that night was John Cena versus R-Truth in a tables match. Truth won after Punk interfered, and then Truth speared Cena through a table. Two things about that. One, it, it's such an amazing footnote that on the night of the pipe bomb, our truth beats John Cena in a tables match because anybody can beat John Cena in a tables match, apparently. Even Seamus. Yeah. And two, that CM Punk runs down to the ring to interfere dressed in a gigantic, like, XXL Stone Cold <laughs> Steve Austin t-shirt. Again, I think he was like, this is going to be a big deal. I can't be wearing my fucking new Nexus shirt while I do this. He was smart for that because he effectively erased that from the narrative. And he was thirsty for the match with Steve Austin. Oh, he still is, I bet. That's the only thing. Maybe could get it. Listen, CM Punk is effectively a free agent, right? The only thing that could get him back is that Steve Austin match. And Steve Austin is training for another match, guys. There is. Triple H called him and was just like, hey, hey, it looks like we might get punk. Start training, Steve. Yeah. So the magic happens. Punk sits down at the top of the ramp, and he begins to speak. And I've transcribed this. We're going to go through it line by line. Let's do it. He starts. I don't hate you, John. I don't even dislike you. I like you a hell of a lot more than I like most people in the back. What I hate is this idea that you're the best because you're not. I'm the best. I'm the best in the world. Interesting that he starts off saying he doesn't hate John Cena. That lends it an air of reality that this isn't, you know, a fake wrestling storyline because he's actually acknowledging, yeah, really got no beef with John Cena. He's a decent enough guy. There's also an element to this storyline where it kind of seems for a while like they're going to lean towards, like, Punk and Cena teaming up against some sort of evil authority, maybe. Like, John Cena goes out of his way to help CM Punk in the next couple of weeks. Like, far out of his way, as we'll get to. So, like, yeah, there's, like, an odd element of, oh, maybe these guys actually like each other. We're already reaching the point in Cena's career where he's desperate to make other stars. Yeah, like, I feel like after the Nexus failure, he was all in on like, no, I like I need somebody who can replace me. I can't keep doing this forever. I wish so much that we could ever get a John Cena opinion on anything ever. But even if he talked about this period, you know, you're not getting his real opinion because John Cena's like completely PR savvy and it's not going to do that. Not. But like he I can. Would- I would love to know if John Cena, like, pushed for this. If he was like, no, I'm jobbing to punk. Fuck you. He continues, there's one thing you're better at than I am, and that's kissing Vince McMahon's ass. You're as good at kissing Vince McMahon's ass as Dwayne. He's a pretty good ass kisser. Always was and still is. There was one now we're was playing missing. with fire. There's one thing that was missing from that. He also brought up Hulk Hogan. Did he? Yeah, he said, the first thing he says is, you're almost as good of an ass kisser as Hulk Hogan was. And Dwayne's a pretty good ass kisser, too. Which I feel like is the first time Hulk's name had been mentioned in years. Yeah. Well, you know, you're throwing in some things you're not supposed to talk about. Hogan's in TNA at the time. It's funny. There's clearly, like, 
I don't know. I feel like one of the only things they told him was you can't talk about TNA. Yeah, they very clearly said don't talk about TNA. Yeah. Like, I don't think there were a lot of limits put on him here, but, yeah, he's definitely not allowed to say TNA here because that's the thing that would have really, really made this feel like it was out of control. I also want to be pretty clear about this. There were so There was so much debate at the time. Did Punk go off script? Did he, did he like, shoot on everybody? Did he? No. All of this was so super collaborative, clearly. And, like, there are lines in here that I would be, I would bet a million dollars that Vince McMahon personally fed to him. But, like, we'll get to those as we go. He goes, oops, I'm breaking the fourth wall. He actually, like, waves to the camera here. That was I am the best wrestler in the world. I've been the best ever since day one when I walked into this company. And I've been vilified and hated since that day because Paul Heyman saw something in me that nobody else wanted to admit. That's right. I'm a Paul Heyman guy. You know who else was a Paul Heyman guy? Brock Lesnar. And he split just like I'm splitting. But the biggest difference between me and Brock is that I'm going to leave with the WWE Championship. All right. Pretty cool to hear Paul Heyman's name mentioned because we have not seen him in WWE in five years at this point. Yes. This is maybe the most outlandish part of the entire promo to me, because none of this has anything to do with any current storyline, but it is very much his real-life situation for the last five years. Where he got brought in, Paul Heyman lobbied for him hard in the back, so hard that it turned people against Punk. CM Punk should tap out the big show in 36 seconds. Yeah, that's the real <laughs> shit that Paul pitched, and he pitched it hard, and he literally it's quit. A big show would have done it. Okay, Paul Heyman literally gave up the control of ECW yes. over CM Punk not being able to tap out Big Show in 30 yeah. seconds. That's and what it happened. Would have been so smart. Oh, would have kicked ass. Punk wouldn't have needed to win that match, but he still would have been made. Like, that's a moment you would have replayed a million times. Big Show goes to chokeslam Punk, and Punk gets him in the Anaconda Vice, and show taps it's also one of the few like submissions you can really put on the big show like it, yeah. it would have worked yeah like would have woken up that sleepy ass december to dismember crowd but because paul heyman doesn't ha- know understand the concept of restraint yeah. after he was told no a hundred times he asked a hundred more times that's pushing it and not only did paul literally get his show and his baby taken away from him forever he like is gone from the company and they just hold it against CM Punk for years. So they had, I believe this was the year they tried to get Lesnar for WrestleMania, and they just couldn't work out a deal with UFC. But Lesnar's UFC career is winding down here. I think they know they're going to get him back soon. I was wondering if that one was fed to him because they know they're getting him back. Because obviously in April he's back. Yeah, he's so, back for WrestleMania. I just imagine them, like, talking in the back and being like, oh, hey, if you're bringing a payment, you should bring up Brock because he's coming back pretty soon. I don't know. Maybe this is just a name, a name we have not heard. Probably, I mean, I don't – did they ever – I can't remember if they ever promoted any of Brock's UFC fights, but it may well have been seven years so. since we heard Lesnar's name on WWE TV at this point. And it gets a pop when he says it, too. Because oh, yeah. people are like, ooh. I'm supposed to say that. He's clearly ticking off a couple of boxes here that we as fans need ticked off to believe that this has any sort of credibility. To make this feel like it's real and not just another wrestling promo. Right. He has to say something about other wrestling promotions. He has to say things that are taboo. They're not so taboo Vince wouldn't really let him say them. They're just things that don't normally happen. He continues. I've grabbed so many of Vincent K. McMahon's imaginary brass rings that it's finally dawned on me that they're just that. They're completely imaginary. The only thing that's real is me. And the fact that the fact is that day in and day out, for almost six years, I've proved to everybody in the world that I'm the best on this microphone, in that ring, even on commentary. Nobody can touch me, and yet, no matter how many times I prove it, I'm not on your lovely little collector's cups. I'm not on the cover of the program. I'm barely promoted. I don't get to be in movies. I'm not on any crappy show on the USA Network. I'm not on the poster for WrestleMania. I'm not on the signature that opens this show. 
I'm not on Conan O'Brien. I'm not on Jimmy Fallon. But the matter of the fact is, I should be. Okay, this one, this part went on too long. Yes, it did. And the only part of this entire promo that I would have nixed if I was producing it is you're not going to say that the shows on the USA Network are crappy on the network we're on. We're not yeah. doing that. Well, again, he's going off script. Yeah, and this was, long- believe, this was like this was. I believe this was not written for him, and I don't. I don't know if I think this was actually approved in advance. You don't think that any part of it was? I mean, I don't. I can believe he's not supposed to say that the shows on the USA Network suck. Yeah, he definitely didn't pass that by anybody. Yeah, I feel like. I feel like there's no possible – let's get to the line that he says that we're going to talk about more before we get into that. It says, and trust me, this isn't sour grapes, but the fact that Dwayne is in the main event of WrestleMania next year and I'm not makes me sick. Which is fair. Yeah. By the way, this is roughly the point in the promo. They keep cutting back to John in the ring, and John's been selling for like five <laughs> yeah. minutes. It's like, dude, all it was was a spear. Come on. But by this point, John's literally just sitting up on the ropes and just, like, watching the promo. And, like, he's all but, like, nodding along to it. Well, he hates The Rock, too, is the thing. Well, that's the thing. Do you think Punk is saying anything here that John Cena, the person or the character, isn't agreeing with? I don't think that he is. Not that I can think of. Says, oh, hey, let me get something straight. Those of you who are cheering me right now, you are just as big a part of me leaving as anyone else. Because you're the ones sipping out of those collector cups right now. You're the ones that buy those programs that my face isn't on the cover of. And then at 5 in the morning at the airport, you're trying to shove them in my face thinking you can get an autograph and sell it on eBay because you're too lazy to get a job. Uh, I didn't. I, it's stupid to be still trying to portray him as the heel at this point. It's worth mentioning that this is meant to be a heel promo. Like, all of it is meant to be a heel promo. That's not how we took it as fans. No, because this company sucks. But that's how it was pitched and constructed. He is meant to be the heel of this storyline. There is no babyface part of this at all at this moment. He says, I'm leaving with the WWE Championship on July 17th, and hell, who knows, maybe I'll go defend it in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Maybe I'll go back to Ring of Honor. Hey, Colt Cabana, how you doing? The degree to which I popped hearing the words New Japan Pro Wrestling in my living room, I lost my mind. This is, I mean, this is still, they do not acknowledge other promotions at this point. Like, it's now become commonplace that, like, they'll talk about, oh, this guy was an IWGP champion, this guy did this in New Japan or in Ring of Honor. Like, they were not at the point where they were doing that yet. Yeah, they just lost their shit, like, two weeks ago because Michael Cole acknowledged that Finn Balor founded the Bullet Club. And it's like, all right, that's, like, the most basic thing that you could possibly say. And, like, everyone lost their shit about it because it's still a little taboo even now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now that Triple H is in charge, they can acknowledge that Riddle beat John Jones in a wrestling match when he was in high school. They fucking should. Yeah. <laughs> like, something Bill Watts would have had them mention every single match the guy ever wrestled. It would have just been the John Jones killer, Matt Riddle. <laughs> yeah. Um, the fact that he shattered him and Colt Cabana, best friends. Yep. What a weird mirror this pipe bomb is yes. to the press conference promo. The They're both actual kill pipe bomb he did all these years later. He did it at similar times during the year. During, this is a kayfabe version of the real-life situation that the press conference was basically carrying on. Yes. And they both revolve around Colt Cabana in some weird way. I mean, the twisted story of him and Colt Cabana Holy is something shit. you could write a movie about. Colt Cabana is at Money in the Bank in the front yeah. row. They like, hug. For the tickets for him. Like, guys, that this isn't guys, that many years ago. No, these guys are best friends turned, like, bitterest of enemies. CM Punk set fire to his wrestling legacy and let it burn just to fuck up Colt Cabana. Yeah. That's a bitter breakup, folks. 
He then says, the reason I'm leaving is you people, because after I'm gone, you're still going to pour money into this company. I'm just a spoke on the wheel. The wheel's going to keep turning. And I understand that Vince McMahon's going to make money despite himself. He's a millionaire who should be a billionaire. You know why he's not a billionaire? It's because he surrounds himself with glad-handed, nonsensical, douchebag yes-men, like John Laurinaitis, who's going to tell him everything he wants to hear. Now, Ooh, boy. I have long debated this point. I don't, maybe he wasn't produced. Maybe he wasn't told what to say. But I do think they gave him some talking points to cover. Like, here's some stuff we want you to hit. Because either he mentions John Laurinaitis here just because everyone hates John Laurinaitis. Yeah. I, the fact that John Laurinaitis, I mean, like, it's probably not a coincidence that John Laurinaitis subsequently starts appearing as an on-air character, and they were probably planning on doing that, so they may have told him, hey, like, shit on Johnny Ace. Yeah, I feel like we're planting some seeds here, is what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he was supposed to say douchebag. They bleeped that out. That's pretty funny, though. And he concludes, and I'd like to think that maybe this company will be better off after Vince McMahon is dead, but the fact is it's going to get taken over by his idiotic daughter and his doofus son-in-law. Now. And the rest of his stupid family. This is the line that I find very difficult to believe, that he didn't workshop with anybody first. Yeah, like, Punk's got balls, but to take a shot at the guy's daughter, it feels like you're going to want to clear that first. I feel like Vince fed him that line. Probably. This is some shit that Vince would be like, say the company will be better when I die. Because you know what else is foreshadowed in this promo? Getting rid of Vince McMahon yes. and giving it to Triple H, which is exactly what happens. They, I mean, they, I think they know they're getting it there. It's funny, like... This is, like, five years in a row they did a storyline where, like, Vince was written out. Like, right. this was every year at this point Vince was trying to get himself off TV. The other I thing that they, they, I think they know they're going to, Vince is going to lose control of the company and Triple H is going to take over. I'm which is a great storyline. I think they know all of the stuff that they want to do in the fall. I think they already have fully planned out. Like, Johnny Ace is, Triple H is going to take over the company, and he's going to do a shitty job, and Johnny Ace is going to try to steal it. Maybe they don't know specifics, like, we're going to get Kevin Nash back and shit like that. But, like, I think they know where they're going. Well, I think, yeah, I think they know they want Triple H to take over, and, yeah, they're going to have, do the storyline where, like, he loses control of things, and Vince has to come back. So I think all of this promo was Punk's own, but I think they, they at least fed him or talked about how he should end the promo. Because also yeah. they have to do the cue where they cut his mic, right? Yeah. So they get to the end. He says, let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. You know how we do this whole bully campaign? And then his mic is cut. So I'm sure that he, they told him, like, when you're done, like, say, let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. Right. And so, like, I feel like just all of it up until the Vince McMahon and his family part, I could absolutely believe was Punk's own. Because it references a lot of his own life. A lot of, like, his very specific frustrations and struggles. I don't think anybody was writing that for him. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff before that is not leading to anything. Whereas yeah. here at the end, he's suddenly shadowing all the storylines that are coming in the next couple months. Does that ruin – do you think that ruins the – you think we're literally going to ruin the pipe bomb for people by letting them know that it was just a storyline to, like, get to Johnny Ace? Pro <laughs> wrestling is booked. It is a work, brother. A lot of people on that night thought it was absolutely just the God's honest shoot. <laughs> we'll discuss that. Yeah. Um, a couple of things they did that was really good here. They did not post this on YouTube. No. They let, like, it was up on YouTube. They didn't t try to take it down. But the videos of it on YouTube were all, like, videos people had screen captured. They did not post this on the company YouTube, despite the fact that this was guaranteed to get millions of views. So I, that was really smart, because that made it seem more legitimate. They did not mention this on the company website. It was not in, like, the recap of the show. I think they just posted, like, a very brief story that was just, like, due to his behavior on Monday Night CM Punk has been suspended indefinitely. 
Now, you and I both know that WWE is not media savvy, or at least not this generation of media savvy, wow. enough to know what it is that they were creating here. That They just didn't. We can just ignore that as a possibility. But what they did by creating that kind of mystery was creating a situation where, like, the fan base joined together to share this with each other. Yeah. And it became a group thing. To the extent where, like, I don't think I talked to anybody in my life for the next two weeks that wasn't about this. Because it's all, it, it's just something you yeah. had I to mean, talk about. I got a lot of texts from people who did not watch wrestling anymore. We're like, holy shit, like, what is this, like, what is this deal with CM Punk? Like, what happened? Like, this set the internet on fire. And, like, to some extent, like, I'm in my little, like, wrestling bubble where I, like, hear the same people talk about it and stuff like that. So I don't always realize what, like, kind of greater impact stuff has in, like, the broader mainstream community. I remember it hit home for me when Sports Illustrated published an article about it online. And this was not when they were doing wrestling articles. Yeah, that's was like, one thing oh. that was first for WWE is this is, like, right at the time where – Mainstream publications are starting to cover wrestling. They're starting to realize that they'll get, like, how much traffic wrestling generates. So this is right when you're starting to see, like, ESPN and Rolling Stone and Sports Illustrated, like, dip their toe into covering wrestling, and this is perfect for it. Yes. And just, like, the number of lapsed wrestling fans that came online and were just like, what the fuck happened? Holy shit. It felt like a moment. I I can't even – if you weren't there for that week, I can't – recreate it i don't think i've ever experienced a more like bigger buzz in like the online wrestling community than that one so i mean people wanted to i mean like nobody really believed that like this wasn't supposed to happen like nobody is that naive but people could believe that like oh he was supposed to do a promo but he went way further than he was supposed to I think that's what everybody believed to a certain extent or another. Like that was the prevailing opinion online was that like, I don't know if they thought like the mic cutting was real or not. There's no way that you can realistically think that it was because they just would have gone to commercial, but there was just elements to it where they're like, I bet you was getting chewed out backstage. There's no way Vince would have let him say that shit. You still there? Yep. Oh, okay. But yeah, I think people could believe that he went too far, which, you know, there's a few, like we said, there's a few things in here that they probably would have preferred he didn't say. And they hadn't done, I feel like they hadn't done one of these in a while. Can you think before this what would have been the last time they did a, I mean, they, maybe some stuff with like Mick Foley and Ric Flair, they had done some like work shoot type of stuff, but it had been a while, I feel like, since they really let somebody loose on the mic. It's something they did all the time in the Attitude Era that they had kind of moved away from. The last time I can really think of one is the lead up to Triple H John Cena at WrestleMania. Yeah. Where Triple H just shat on John Cena. Yeah. Or he just kind of went into business for himself and was like, yeah, actually, John Cena sucks ass. See, Triple H would get to do this kind of thing from time to time. Oh, yeah. And then would. But again, yeah. and the Hayden stuff is five, you know, the, the, the ECW stuff is five years before this. Yeah. It, it, it's just been so, and it feels disconnected from this particular era because we're deep into what people called the PG era. Yeah. We're like, there's none of this kind of edgy shit at all. So there's one weird and unfortunate quirk to this, which is the timing. This Raw was June 27th. That means the next Raw was going to fall on the 4th of July. And, you know, as a result, they didn't want to do a live 4th of July show because they were concerned it wouldn't draw. So they actually taped the next episode of Raw immediately after this one ended. So this one ended, they, you know, cleaned out the ring and whatever – cleaned out the ring, and, you know, 20 or 30 minutes later, they started up the net, taped the next episode of Raw to air the next Monday. This creates a completely bizarre set of circumstances, where the following week, they basically, 
while the world is on fire yes. about the pipe bomb, that episode of Raw, CM Punk is still absolutely a heel. Nothing has changed. The storyline <laughs> is exactly the way they laid it out. And then the week after that, it takes an unbelievable right turn. Yeah, I think it's fair to say this episode of Raw would have been very different if it had been live and they had had a week to, like, see the reaction to the promo. I mean, I guess one thing we hit on, they were crazy not to – I don't remember this for sure, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have Punk do any interviews afterwards. They were – I would have let him loose anywhere that would have talked to him, and I would have told him, just keep going, just keep talking. He doesn't cut any monologue interviews. He has a couple of segments with Vince, but they're all with Vince, which is weird. I mean, I would I would have been like, oh, Rolling Stone wants to interview you? Do it. Like, ESPN will interview you? Do it. And keep shitting on people. That's what they want to hear. Yeah, just give it to them all day. Like, do a fucking interview. Give everybody the business. Give Meltzer a fucking interview. How would you not do that? I don't know how cool that would have been. Yeah, I'm leaving, Dave. I'm out. I'm pretty sure, like, Jim Rome, like, was like, I'd love to have CM Punk on and have him, like, talk to me about this. Like, they were crazy that they didn't take him up on that offer. Just, like, you've got, like, a new Roddy Piper that's, like, lit on fire in your hands. Let him loose. That would have been unreal if they just sent him around the circuit to shit on everybody. I do wonder if there was a part of them that was like, Eh, but we don't have him under contract, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, th- I don't know if he had quite signed yet. I'm sure by now. Like, I don't think they would have done this if they hadn't, like, if they weren't close on terms. I'm sure, like, but even then, I'm sure they're worried, okay, if he gets too over, like, he's going to ask for a bunch more money. So this is the point where I have to point out that I discovered in between the last episode and this one, that there was something that actually talked about this. And CM Punk put out a DVD for WWE called Best in the World. And he briefly talked about this whole thing. And according to him, the only reason he stayed with the company is because Lars Fredrickson of Rancid said, you can really help all the young guys by staying there, Punk. You you really got to stay there so you can stick up for them. And he did not re-sign the contract until an hour before his match on the night of Money in the Bank, according to him. Yeah, but also I don't think his con I, his con I don't believe that his contract was actually expiring that night. Yeah, I bet you it expired in like August. Come on now. Yeah, like, yeah it was not that night. Like, it's one thing. Yeah, he signed the extension at Money in the Bank. Sure, that means they had already worked out the terms because that's just like the formal thing. They had already worked out how long it was going to be, how much he was going to be paid. But also, yeah, like, I don't, I do not believe his contract was actually expiring that night. Yeah, I do do believe that they had, like, the the Bret Hart Montreal meeting where they were like, all right, before I put the belt on you, let's have a fucking chat. They were not going to put the belt on him if he wasn't under contract. Right. That is true. Like, and you've heard stories like that. Like, Bischoff's talked about, like, having to chase Chris Jericho down backstage at Nitro and be like, sign this contract or I'm taking the belt off you tonight. Yeah, that's complicated, and it sucks. <laughs> okay, so anyway, Raw July 4th, 2011, actually taped June 27th, 2011, still at the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas, which means they have to do the weird thing where they never say where the show is taking place. It's also a really weird show because the crowd's really hot at the beginning, and now we know why, because they just heard the fucking pipe bomb. And they're waiting for Punk to come back out, which he doesn't, which... No. I don't know. I think that's also kind of madness that he wasn't on the show the next week. It, it's just fucking weird, right? Yeah. But how can you cut a pipe bomb and then walk back out in front of that crowd again to cut a less significant promo? Like, it's weird. <laughs> Held him off until the but like, Imagine the reaction if he comes through the crowd with a ball horn. Hell yeah. They open the show with a recap of the CNR Truth Tables match and the punk promo, which kind of the first, like, I wouldn't have shown the promo. Yeah, just don't mention it. it. Yeah, I would have tried to play it like, no, we're not talking about that. Like, maybe the the announcers briefly say that, like, you know, CM Punk has been suspended due to his actions last week. He will not be facing John Cena at Money in the Bank. But Cena opens the show. 
He talks about Punk's promo. He says he's in favor of free speech. He wants to defend the title against CM Punk at Money in the Bank. He says Vince is on his way to the arena, and Cena wants to talk to him later that night. Now, I feel like they make a gigantic mistake with that segment later in the show. Because, like, how much more impactful would it have been if you got, like, one of those, like, hidden camera peeking around the corner, and that's how you hear the conversation between Vince and John? I feel like that's better than just doing it in front of the crowd, right? It was a it was a good promo. We'll get there in a second. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Alberto Del Rio wins a triple threat match against Rey Mysterio and R-Truth to become number one contender. <sighs> the number of times they were going to put the belt on Del Rio this year and didn't is hilarious. The, as we go through this whole thing, I just want you guys to keep in the back of your head like a mental idea of where Alberto Del Rio is in all of this. Because he's just a weird grain of sand that doesn't belong. And he's constantly in the middle of it. He is like an onion in the middle of an ice cream sundae. When you go back and read the results of these shows, and you're like, what the fuck is he doing there? If they had just put him on SmackDown, everything's different. Yeah, But he's the guy they want to push. Like, he's their guy. They've got this tour of Mexico coming up. They want him to be the world champion when they go down there. The only thing they care about from all of this is that they make Alberto Del Rio a star. That's it. And that Vince gets off TV. Just think about that for the whole summer. Those are the two goals. So for the main event segment, Vince comes down to the ring. He explains that he suspended CM Punk because he disrespected Vince in WWE. And then he goes to leave, but Cena interrupts him. John Cena comes down to the ring to, like, take the ceremonial crown off of Sting's head for dumbest baby face who's ever walked the face of the earth and put it on his own. And Vince McMahon is the dumbest authority figure in history, which is saying something. Yep. Cena says that Vince believes in the First Amendment, and Vince says and does whatever he wants. He says that attitude is how he beat WCW. Vince admits that, you know... The real reason he suspended punk, suspended punk is not because Punk said mean things about him, but because he's afraid that Punk is going to beat Cena and then leave the company with the belt. That's a weird Better thing to be worried about. That's a weird moment of honesty from Vince. Yeah, like where he's like, like, does feel real. And then he says. He's going to take that belt and walk into some other wrestling organization with it, which is not something that, like, Vince Vince doesn't say wrestling. Everything about this, the words, the letters T and A are, like, hovering over his entire storyline. Yeah, but nobody's allowed to say that. If Vince had ever just said it, like, what? You think I'm going to let him show up in TNA with my belt? Like, it would have felt like this unbelievable taboo being broken. Like, more so than anything said in the pipe bomb. Vince saying the letters T and A would have been like, what? Um, Cena says, you know, him against Punk would be the match of the year. Vince tells him not to be like Hogan and Brett and the other guys went against him. He says, don't piss me off, which... It's another thing that I don't think Vince is... Vince doesn't usually use that kind of language. That's too crude. Yeah. He also... When was the last time he acknowledged the Hogan and Brett shit? Like, when he wrestled Hogan at WrestleMania? Yeah, I mean, like, again, they're talking about Hogan. Hogan's in TNA at this point. I mean, Brett has been around a lot, because Brett and Vince had done their program the year before this. But still, I guess to, like, right. put it... To put in those terms of like, oh yeah, Brett tried to leave with the belt and look what happened to him. Acknowledging Vince McMahon, the promoter, outside of Vince McMahon, the character, is just a thing they weren't really comfortable doing, or that he wasn't really comfortable doing. So when they get that out of him here, like, it it really contributes to the storyline. So... Vince still won't let the match go on. Cena says, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. He throws the belt down and he goes to walk out. Vince, you know, grabs the belt, follows him up to the top of the ramp, says, you can have the match with Punk, but if you lose, you're fired. Now. 
this is maybe the most interesting part of the whole storyline to me. Because at least when they first announced it here, I, in the back of my head, it's like, oh, I guess Punk's losing then. But as as we got closer... Yeah, it raises the stakes. Because if it actually becomes possible for Punk to win, then you have to deal with the very actual yes. possibility of po- Cena getting fired and what that Probably means. Is Cena got fired the year before this in the Nexus storyline, and he was literally... He, I don't think he literally missed a single show. Well, yes, he did. He was replaced by a man named Juan Cena in a luchador <laughs> mask. Exactly. Yeah, he was still on every single Raw. Like, yeah, he was literally gone for like an hour. But still, it just, I don't know. On one level, it's a gimmick on a gimmick. But yeah, when they announced that, I'm like, oh, well, I guess that means Punk's not going to win then. Because, like, they're not going to do another Cena gets fired angle. They did that last year. But somehow, whereas most of the time... Stacking the deck like that against Punk makes it so clear he's not going to win. Most of the time, that makes people check out. But in this case, it just made people want it more somehow. Like it, it was, it worked in a really surreal way. So, I mean, overall, good promo, strong stuff. Yeah, John Cena is like the unsung hero of this whole storyline. No <laughs> one gives <laughs> here. Nobody gives him praise or credit. None of this works without him. None of it. Like, he, no. he's going for it. He always had great... I feel like he... Maybe not always, but at this point, he'd settled into... He knew how to sell his big match. Like, he could always cut that promo about how much this match meant to him. I also feel like the promos against The Rock, which have already begun... Wake something up in him where he wants to do some more complex shit. Like, he wants to tell more interesting stories. Like, he feels restless in his, like, I'm the Marine, I win every time, ha, 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 thing. Like, you can just tell that he wants something else. He had gotten bored with that. This let him do some more interesting stuff. And by this point, he's it's something interesting because he has become the establishment so the meta storyline of everyone trying to knock him off is interesting and compelling. It's the next five years of television is people yeah. trying to take his place. Okay. So in between when that was taped and when the next thing was the next Raw, they go on a tour of Australia. A couple things happen here. First, despite Punk being "quote unquote" suspended, he still makes all the shows, as they explain that they explain that Vince believes in keeping his promises. On the show in Brisbane, they had Punk wrestle Cena in like a thirty-minute match that was, you know, it's that's their test match where they're going to try out some spots for the pay-per-view. Said to be very good, started a little slow and was a little sloppy, which doesn't surprise me because honestly, both. Oh, Punk can be sloppy and Cena can be clunky. Yeah. Uh, Cena's not quite to the point that he would get to where he's, like, capable of having the greatest match of all time with anyone. Uh, and Punk and Cena are, like, kind of a stylistic, weird mishmash a little bit. So, like, even when the match that we get at the pay-per-view isn't, like, perfect, it's, like, kind of sloppy in a couple ways. But not not a few things in it. Cena, I feel like Cena's got to be kind of tough to work with because he's just so... Thick and heavy. He's not an easy guy to move. And, like, Cena's not super mobile or flexible because he's so bulky. Yeah, and every move that he does, he does in a way that only John Cena does it, which must be super weird for selling that shit. And there's an unfortunate unfortunate incident where Punk got into it with some fans who were heckling him. I did not remember this. He said something like, nice faux hawk homo to one of them. Yeah. He quickly issued an apology for that. Um, turns out WWE had recently entered into a partnership with Glad and was very embarrassed by this. In the moment where CM Punk yeah. has had the moment that will break him out of the humdrum mediocrity he's been in, he fucking self sabotage He almost blows it completely. I mean, doesn't it just feel like this man has kind of a self-destructive streak to him? Absolutely he does. Just, yeah. (laughs) Like, this gets papered over. Like, he quickly issues what seemed like a pretty sincere apology. 
WWE apparently assured Glad that Punk was actually leaving after Money in the Bank. They kayfabed him. They were like, oh no, his contract is about to expire. He's leaving. I want to be clear that this is the second time in history that <laughs> WWE has done business with Glad. And the first time was the Billy and Chuck wedding. They just kayfabed the shit out of him. <laughs> oh, man. Um we then get to the July 11th Raw, which is at the Fleet Center in Boston. Um, so, of course, the July 4th episode did a really low rating. It's taped. It's on a holiday. Those shows are never going to do well. This show does a 2.91 rating, which was the lowest non-holiday number in several months. Yeah. I mean, as we go through all of this that we're going to talk about during the season – the lack of actual effect on real business is going to come this, up again and again. It's, it's, it, as much as this was entertaining and interesting and appealed to a segment of their fan base, it really did not do business. Just this is a, this is maybe the greatest possible indicator that I'm not sure that at this in this era that we're in now, it's possible to extend beyond like the reach of like your normal wrestling audience to get anybody else except for like a WrestleMania or something just by the power of a good enough storyline. Cause this, this absolutely lit our entire community on fire and it didn't go anywhere else. Yeah. They made no money from it. I mean, punk, you can say demonstrably drew an AEW, but that's just such a different thing as he was getting people who were already, you know, watching WWE to watch AEW here was not really able to bring those lapsed fans back. And I can believe that because, you know, out of all those people who texted me, I don't think very many of them actually started watching again. No, they just thought it was cool, but that doesn't mean they want to watch the shows, which still suck, by the way. <laughs> well, still, absolutely. Like, anything that Punk is not involved in is unwatchable on these shows. I wouldn't have been surprised at all if, like, the first 15 minutes rating was, like, a 5, and then the second 15 minutes was a 1. <laughs> Yeah, people tuned in. Oh, it's not Punk. Tune out. Oh, cane match, huh? Bye. <laughs> yeah. So this did have tough competition. It was up against the Home Run Derby on ESPN. But the previous year's show that went up against the, the Derby did a 3.3 rating. Like, the Nexus storyline actually did pop ratings. Yeah. Like, if you actually compare this all the way through, the, the Nexus storyline demolishes the Summer of Punk. As like, much as people would never believe that and not want to hear that, it's true. The SummerSlam main event to buy Punk versus the SummerSlam main event to buy the Nexus does like 60,000 less buys. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, an interesting note from the Observer on the shakeup with the creative team. Glad I found this because we were talking last week about like who was in charge of creative. Brian Gewurz had been writing Raw. Michael Hayes had been writing SmackDown. They were both reporting to Stephanie McMahon. They were both promoted, so they were both kind of now going to oversee creative across the two shows and still report to Stephanie. Um, Dave Kapoor, who's Runjan Singh, was promoted to be the head writer on Raw. Ed Kosky was promoted to be the head writer on SmackDown. I don't know. I mean, it's creating more – I think it's a couple things. It's creating more bureaucracy with the creative team that you're going to have another layer of management. It feels like we're just promoting Gewurz and Hayes because they've been in those roles for a really long time, and maybe they're a little burned out and struggling with having to write week-to-week TV. I mean, you can definitely see, like, Michael Hayes and Brian Gewurz have both written some amazing television. Yeah. Uh, they seem pretty burnt out. You can probably tell. God, Gewurz has been there forever. Like, Gewurz – didn't he start back like in the ad? Didn't he start like right when Russo left? He was the person who was hired by Chris Kresge. Yeah. So like that's, that's the person that's who like took like over the show. Thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So like, Man. read his book yet? I haven't. I haven't. I really want to though. Yeah. Looks like I mean I've seen some interviews he's done about it. I'm guessing there's some good stuff in there. Um, the other thing that makes sense is. They know they're ending the roster split, so kind of trying to establish some more continuity between the shows makes sense. The other problem with this, though, is that you're now creating a situation where it's even harder to, like, to kind of steer the ship quickly. Because, like, if you have a meeting, 
that reports to Gwartz and Hayes, and then they have to report to Stephanie, yeah. and then she has to report to Vince because those people aren't actually in the meetings anymore. You're creating a situation where it's real quick to be quick on the draw when stuff like this happens, for example. So Punk opens the show to do a promo. He brings out a bullhorn in case they cut his mic. I loved that. That's a great touch. Yeah, that uh, that feels like something that his was his idea, and that is very good. Um, he gets a like I'd say he got a stars response here, but a mix of boos and cheers, but much bigger than the reactions he had been getting before this. He was getting almost none before this, so yes, big. Clearly, something has changed. He opens up saying he didn't bother to watch the show last week since he wasn't on it and he wouldn't blame anybody else if they didn't watch it. He said he does believe this company is filled with shameless ass kissers. He said um, this is the first time he talked about the promo being a pipe bomb. That's the um, genesis of that phrase. He said Vince desperately wanted to sign him to a lucrative contract because He's made WWE relevant again for the first time in a long time. He said, the only time the real media covers WWE is either because CM Punk is speaking his mind or because somebody died. Fuck. That's a spit shot. Well, here's the thing, too. How do you follow the pipe bomb? Right? Like, you're now... I was going to say Chris Benoit. Yeah, but now you're going to have to, like, put something like this in every promo you do, Right. It's hard to be edgy all the time, and I think, yeah, they end up doing some pretty stupid stuff because of that. Yeah, this is a pretty good line, though. This feels about right. Like, it's stiff, but it feels right. Yeah. He proposed that him and Vince should do a contract negotiation on live TV that night, and then Cena interrupts. He ran down all the guys in the past who said they were better than him and then promised that he'd whip Punk's ass at Money in the Bank. I hated this. Yeah. There's something about John Cena treating this like a normal wrestling storyline that felt offensively wrong. Yeah. What do you think Cena should have been involved at all here? What do you think he should have said? If anything, I think he should have been like, look, they don't want us to have this match, but I I feel like I owe this match to you because you earned it. Like, have him be like, I think he should also be like, you say you're the best in the world. But I've been carrying this company for years now. Everybody thinks they're better than me. How many guys have gotten this title and cracked under the pressure? I never have. Are you sure you're ready for this? I'm the 10-time champion. Also, feel free to bring up, I fought you like a dozen times before. You're 0-12. What do you mean you're better than me? I thought Punk had never beaten him. Oh, wait, thought, maybe Punk had no, beaten him every I, time. I don't know. I don't think he had, yeah, I don't think he had ever beaten Punk. I think, like, it, not that Punk, like, pinned him every time, but it was, like, there's been a lot of DQs and count outs. I think it actually, like, and they blew that off in the wrong way, but for a long time, I feel like Cena had never beaten him. So maybe that's something that's good. Like, I can say all I want that I believe in honor and blah, 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 and that's why I want to fight you, but honestly, I've never beaten you. And maybe yeah. you're right and you are the best in the world, and I have to beat you to know that I am. Like, have him have some sort of honest motivation for wanting to be part of this match. Because what we get is a John Cena that just kind of, like, walks in like, fuck it, I'll do it, whatever. Doesn't make sense. So, I nothing else of note happens on this show until the main event, which is an incredibly long segment. Like, this is like 30 minutes, guys. Yeah, I'm not exaggerating. It's over 25 minutes. This is one of the longest promo segments I can ever remember. And it's all just Vince McMahon sitting in a chair while CM Punk monologues at him. So, yeah. Punk antagonizes Vince. He makes a series of ludicrous demands. He says he wants a private jet. He wants his face on everything. He wants his face on the Titan Tron. Ice cream the- bars. Yeah, this is where he brings up the ice cream bars. He wants the ice cream bars brought back, which that got a big pop. Weird that, like, I don't think anyone had actually thought about the ice cream bars in 20 years, but it was like a shared memory we all had, like, oh, yeah. And they did eventually bring the ice cream bars back. Yes, they did, and it they did not sell because they're actually terrible. 
Um, he said he wanted a movie made about him. He took some shot at what the chaperone did not. Wasn't that a movie starring Triple H? Yep. Um, he wanted the main event spot at WrestleMania. He complained about Vince firing his friends. He mentioned Colt Cabana and Luke Gallows. He demanded that Vince apologize to him, and I think this is the first time he called himself the voice of the voiceless. It is. He's really turning face now. Here's the weird thing about this promo. He is, to us, absolutely saying nothing but babyface things. 100% babyface. But I believe in my heart that Vince fed him some of this stuff because he thinks that Punk is being a 100% heel. And I, I can't decide. Because, like, just the fact that he's saying all these things to Vince. Vince knows that he's the heel. He's always the heel. But I, I can't believe in my heart that Vince thinks that these are babyface things to say. Vince did eventually apologize. He says, I apologize, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and then Punk says that was better than winning the world title three times. The other problem with this segment, too, is Punk comes off pretty fucking whiny in it. Yeah, like Because it, it goes on for so long. CM Punk is a heel. It's what he's good at. Yeah, that's the problem, is that if you keep this to, like, ten minutes, it's totally effective. But it goes on for so long that he kind of seems like a crybaby asshole about it. But then we get to the good part when John Cena comes out. Yeah. Cena comes out. He says that... um he compares Punk threatening to walk out with Rock Lion about coming back and never leaving again. I like that because that's clearly one of John Cena's like biggest things yes. right now. I like him connecting it to that. Punk talks about having to be part of Cena's entrance at WrestleMania 22. He said he swore that night he would beat Cena someday. He said Cena was a fake underdog like all the Boston sports teams are now. And he says Cena's become the New York Yankees. And then Cena punches them. It's such a good line. And, like, maybe yeah. he spends a little bit too long, like, building up to it because he knows it's such a good line. But saying to Cena's face that you are the New York Yankees. Cena, like, a born and bred oh. Massachusetts boy. Yeah, worst thing you can say. But I do, I do love this. Is like Boston sports fans are the whiniest people on the planet. Yeah. All of their teams have won so many championships. Particularly when you think about these years, it's like the Red Sox have won a couple series, the Patriots have won how many Super Bowls, the Bruins have just won the Stanley Cup, the and Celtics have just won a couple Celtics years before the championship. Yeah, and like, and yet they still fucking whine. Well, it's that's what makes it such a killer line is that like not only do Boston sports fans always think that they're the underdog even though they're not, that's also John Cena's persona yes. now. He's always been this underdog, even though there's no way you could think of him as that. LOL Cena wins is the meme. He's a ten time world champion. He beats everybody. You are the house. That that's what your identity is. That's what it becomes. Yeah. But like it's as if the character John Cena couldn't accept it until Punk said it. And that's what makes him punch him in the face. So Punk once again promises he would win the title and leave, and then he tears up the contract. And Vince is like, Well, look at that, you dumb SOB. You just screwed everything up. And Punk, Cena making that whiplash decision to punch him, like, fucks everything. And in that moment, you can see the guilt on his face, like, oh, no. Oops. Oh, sorry, boss. But people That's don't get we're... to Cena like that either. You don't get yeah. emotions like that out of yeah. him. Without attacking his dad. Although yeah. Punk, did, Punk also talks some shit about his dad, who's sitting in the front row. And see, like, the scene is just kind of like, hey, hey, ease up. Slow, slow down there, buddy. Yeah. But he didn't go over the top and beat up his dad like Edge and Randy Orton had, because yeah, that would make this a fake wrestling storyline. Yeah, Edge just full-on, like, teabagged his dad in his childhood home. That's a whole other thing. He could have, like, thrown – he could have just thrown Vince McMahon into, like, the bay. <laughs> that would have been fun. So that's where we leave it as we head into Money in the Bank. I mean, there was a SmackDown after this, but, yeah. No, no, none of this occurred on SmackDown because nobody was watching SmackDown at this point. No. 
it's so interesting. These three weeks contain some of like the wildest moments that have taken place on TV in years and years and years and years and years. But they're prob as far as three weeks of television go, they feel like completely disconnected from each other because they they just wildly change in that third week to oh he's a babyface fuck. And that second week is so dead because we all know that that's not the reality that we're living in anymore. And then the pipe bomb was the week before. It's just a weird three weeks to have existed. So, yeah, that's the thing is the the taped part of it, the, the fact that they taped the two weeks of TV at once, I feel like Seth just set this up in such a strange way because this became so much bigger than they were expecting it to be, but they didn't, they couldn't respond to it as quickly as they were expecting to. I mean, I can't even imagine being put in that situation that like they've had other guys that got over kind of unexpectedly and they had to like steer by that, but never this fast, never like in one night, the internet has turned CM Punk into their top star. No. Like how how do you even steer with that? Yeah, I mean I'm sure that like second, um, I feel like the follow up show would have been different if it weren't taped. Like I don't think they would have kept Punk off that show. I also yeah, think I maybe it was the maybe it was the right decision to not have him on because he got to build more, but. Uh, yeah, I, I'm usually a believer in striking when things are hot. Agreed. I will say, uh, at some other later date, we're going to cover the uh, the Daniel Bryan like rise to prominence, which is basically just this storyline except done correctly. And like you can see them like learning from their mistakes there that they made here, where they're just like, oh fuck, we got to change everything, uh, throw everything in the air. Oh, we didn't react fast enough. We got to double react now. And that one, they just, like, took their time and sorted it out and got everything they wanted out of it. Whereas in this one, man, from week to week, I don't think even they know what they want to get out of this storyline anymore. It's up that they want Alberto Del Rio to have the belt. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it is Punk becoming a huge star was not in their plans, and it ends up screwing up a lot of their plans, and they don't love that. So I feel like they end up kind of going halfway with it instead of all the way. I will say that there have been other times in history where things like this happen, not quite like this, where they just fucking ignored it completely. Like, nope, you can look at Zack Ryder, for example. Yeah. Like, nope, the sorry, funny, we're not doing that. The funny thing here is because the whole storyline is he's going to leave, they could have just kept him away for longer, and they would have been able to do all the stuff they actually wanted to do while he was gone. Yeah, and we're going to get to that. Back. Yeah. When we talk about then, Money in the Bank, yeah, for sure. Like, Of course he has to be back by WrestleMania, but there's no need to bring him back anywhere near as fast as they actually did. Every time we've ever talked about this, I've said the same thing. I would have brought him back at the Rumble and not before. And I know it's so hard. It's so hard to leave that money on the table for six months. And I get it. But, buddy, like, that could have been a game changer. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, that's a wrap for this one. A little bit different than our usual shows, but I enjoyed the format change here. Yeah, we certainly never covered three Raws before on one show. Oh. But, yeah, I like this. And, like, being able to tell the story as it progresses. And we've even learned more stuff about the story as we like go and research in between. I like that. Yeah. So next time we will be to the big show money in the bank in Chicago. Um, one of the great WWE pay-per-views of all time, like really definitely one of the best, you know, B shows of all time. And I think I can say without any hesitation that this is probably the best poor selling pay-per-view in wwe history yeah we'll talk about that not even i think one of the top 10 like drawing b pay-per-views of all time not even close yeah it um you know gonna be a running theme that for what all the creative successes they have here does not really translate into business success yeah we'll get more into that but like even more devastatingly in the other direction than i think most people realize <laughs> yeah We'll have all that and more next time on the Lockcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next time.